If you're a believer in Christ and maybe you're trying to live this whole thing, sometimes you come against these obstacles and you're like, you know what, God, it was better before I was smart enough to realize there's something better out there, but it's too hard to achieve. So I wish I was a stupid sinner still before. And today we're gonna see that similar to my story is the same thing that the people of Israel faced, that we've been talking about what kept them on the wrong side of the river is one of the things that we see today is when we attempt to define our reality by our power rather than God's, we start to distort our future. You hear that? When we attempt to define our reality by define reality by our power rather than God's, is our future gets really distorted. What do I mean by that? It is so often when we have these big issues, what we look at is here are all the things I gotta do. Here are all the problems I gotta overcome. And then this is everything I'm facing right now. But the problem is if you can fix all your problems you have in your life, well then frankly, you're not swinging enough hard enough for bigger problems. If your problems are all so small that by your power, by your intellect, by your discipline, you can solve every one of them, then man, God has bigger plans in his life for you. And you see, as we dive into this today and we see this story, as we, as we continue this series through Crossing Rivers, Israel came to this point where they were looking to the promised land. They were looking to leave this wilderness of monotony to go into something amazing. But when they saw it, they're like, that's just too big for us. But it wasn't too big for God. And today we're going to look at two different realities that we can define. The realities that we define by our own power and the realities we define through God's. And the first kind of start in this journey is we're going to look at what happens when we just start to define reality by our own power. And our story we're going to pick up today is in Numbers chapter 20. So you can start flipping there. You can grab the Bible in front of you and kind of make your way there. But if you haven't been with us through this series, let me give you a little recap of this. That in in the life of Joshua, Joshua is the man who would lead God's people. He'd leave 600,000 men to fight battles to take the promised land. And then after that, he would take 2 million people then to go occupy that land. But for 40 years prior to that, those same people wandered around a wilderness, lost, confused, scared. And so many of the reasons they wandered around that wilderness was because they constantly fell short of God's vision for their life and did dumb thing after dumb thing after dumb thing. We've looked at some of those ways that they defied God's plan. One of those is they worshiped false idols. As soon as they saw something that was a little bit too big for them, that they got scared God wasn't there, they made a golden calf. And it ended oh so poorly. They continue on, and we saw that they fell into the idol, almost another one of complacency, that they roamed so long that finally two and a half tribes are like, you know what, this is good enough. I'm going to settle. I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to lower my expectations of what God and I can achieve, and I'm going to be comfortable in it. But that wasn't the only problem they also fall into. Last week, we looked at fear. And they were so afraid of fighting the battles of what God had for them that they forgot who was on their side. And today we're going to look at the last issue and the last real problem that kept them on the wrong side of the river is defining this reality by their own terms. And in Numbers chapter 20, starting in verse 1, we see how this story starts. And it says this, that the entire Israelite community entered the wilderness of Zin in the first month and they settled in Kadesh. Miriam died and was buried there. So for this first verse, it really gives us context on this little mini story we're going to see. The first thing we see is they've been roaming around the wilderness, but they are roaming around. And as they did, one of the key leaders of their group, Miriam, who was Moses' sister, she passes away. So there's like this ache, there's this sadness that they're losing someone who is so close. But there's an interesting language in here is they settle in Kadesh. And what's crazy is they had already been to this place, meaning they had gone in a circle. They didn't make any progress forward, but they ended up somewhere where they had already been. And they're like, what are we doing? 
And the very first thing that we're going to see is when we start to define reality by our own power is the same thing that Israel do that we even do today is we fight against instead of working with. Let's keep reading, starting in verse 2. It says this, that there was no water for the community. So they assembled against Moses and against Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. You see, as Israel starts to work backwards, as they seem to roam around into nothing, instead of looking for solutions and partnering with the two biggest leaders that are kind of, they're following in this, they start to point blame at them. It says what, it says, they didn't say they worked with Moses and Aaron, it says they assembled against them. And as they're assembling against them, they didn't be like, hey guys, uh, can we figure this out? And so they said, hey guys, you're idiots, we're gonna fight. And all of a sudden, they start getting angry. They start getting mad. They start attacking those leaders. Jump back into my story. That I said I had all these things weighing on me and these ideas of like, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? How, 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 is, how am I going to make enough money for this? And you know who the first person that I kind of quarreled with and fought with? My wife. You know who is most innocent in this entire situation? My wife. But here's the thing is sometimes by proximity, she just happened to love me and be close, she got the brunt of my frustration overflowing. And if we're honest, that's a lot of times how we work in the rhythms of our life is the people we should be running to, that we should be talking to, that we should be, let's game plan this together, are the persons we usually snap at and get mad at, and then all of a sudden there's fighting happen, and then we fast forward a little bit and we're like, why are we fighting? And we have no idea. And we do it with family members, we do it with our spouses, we do it with our kids, we do it with our friends, and so often the people that we should be turning to are the people that we're working against instead of working with for a solution. And you see that when we look at the reality of our situation and the more bleak it looks, the more upsetting it becomes, instead of facing it, what we look to do is we try to distract ourselves by picking fights with other people. And here's the funny thing, the more fights you pick with other people instead of picking the fight with your problem and working through it, the problem just gets worse and worse and worse behind the scenes. Imagine that. (laughs) And here's some encouragement for you today. Because maybe you hear that, maybe you're feeling convicted, and maybe you're feeling a little bit like a failure there. My encouragement, and I say this all the time, is you are not alone. This is a human problem that's literally been happening for thousands of years as we see in the nation of Israel. Here's some discouragement. It's childish and you need to grow up. And when I say that, I'm talking to myself first, right? Because I convicted myself at the beginning of this story. And when we see these issues arise, it's not something that we just turn a blind eye to. It's something that we know is an issue, but we have to work through. But you see, it gets worse because not only do we find reality and, and we start to fight with others instead of with them, but we also define reality by our own power when we see obstacles instead of opportunities. Pick back up in verse four. It says, why have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? This is Israel's complaints to Moses. Like, why did you bring us in here so we could die? Verse five. It gets better. Why have you led us from Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain, figs, vines, and pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Let me give you a little context here for you. Is they said, why did we come to this place? Why did we just come here so we could die? They said, it'd be better if we're dead than being alive here right now. And then they said, why did you take us out of Egypt? A little bit of context, if you know the background of the story, in Egypt, they were slaves. 
And this wasn't even more slavery that we see throughout the biblical story. Usually slavery, especially in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, a lot of that slavery was more like a work contract. Is you had a debt and you had to work until your debt was gone and then you could become a freed man. But that's not even what this slavery was. This slavery was more like what we see in American history where a slavery because of the ethnicity of their nation and they were gonna be slaves forever. And they got freed from that. Moses literally led them out through the power of God from that. And they're like, man, it would be better if we were slaves back in Egypt. Now you hear that and you're like, that's absurd. That's crazy. That's insane. Like why in the world are, are they complaining in this situation? Because, but here's the problem of what happened is the wilderness had some big obstacles. So what they think, instead of saying, how can we get past these obstacles? They're like, you know what? My life before was better. And as Christians, we can relate with this. If you're a believer in Christ and maybe you're trying to live this whole thing, sometimes you come against these obstacles and you're like, you know what, God, it was better before I was smart enough to realize there's something better out there, but it's too hard to achieve, so I wish I was a stupid sinner still before. And we can all fall into that trap. I'm like, I want my old life when I was broke and poor and I had no responsibilities. Take me back to that. And God's like, are you serious? And he is doing the same thing with Israel here is they were so blinded by their current situation that they couldn't see what God was doing in their future. And they complained that there is no hope that death would be better when it's just not the case. These past few weeks when I had those stresses over my life, All I was thinking about is, how am I going to fix this? How am I going to fix this? And then all these obstacles kept popping up of what I'm seeing. Okay, this is going to be an issue. I don't think I could solve it this way. I don't think I could solve it this way. And finally, as I'm writing this sermon, that's when I usually get convicted the most, when I'm like, I'm going to teach this. And then I'm like, am I allowed to teach this if I'm still terrible at this? All of a sudden, God showed me some opportunities. And let me be frank and honest with you before is, The opportunity I think God showed me is probably for the very first time that maybe I needed to be financially dependent on God, okay? I've been pretty blessed and lucky in my life that I've had a plan, that I've been disciplined in my finances, that I've had steady work and I've had jobs. And if I'm honest, I've given to God, but I've never expected God to give me back financially. I'm like, God, I got that covered. I'm smart enough. I work hard enough. God, I'll work it. I mean, like you handle the spiritual stuff and I'll handle the practical stuff, God. And this is the relationship we have. And for the first time, God's like, you know what? You're not as smart as you think you are. You're not as talented or maybe even as hardworking as you think you are. And maybe you need to depend on me in this season and trust me to get you through this obstacle. And here's the deal is usually we pray these prayers of just these laundry list of items we want God to fix, but maybe the prayers we need to say is, God, let me be dependent and trust you no matter what comes. That's a scary prayer to pray. Because when you pray that, he's going to hold you to that. And here the people of Israel were so stuck in the fact that there is no way they can get through this when they weren't looking at how big the God they served was which leads to the very last way we define reality by our own power is we rely on our ability instead of God's holiness. Pick back up in verse 10. We're going to skip down and we're going to cover these other verses in just a second. But in verse 10, it says, Moses and Aaron summoned the assembly in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock for you? Then Moses raised his hand and he struck the rock twice with his staff so that the abundant water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me to demonstrate my holiness in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. In just a minute, we're going to read the instructions before this that God gave to Moses and Aaron of how they were going to conduct this miraculous act. 
But here's what the deal is, is God was going to work through Moses to deliver something to their people. But in the middle of this, Moses felt he needed to exert his authority and his power to show the Israelites that he was in charge. And Moses kind of flipped the script here. He's like, I'm going to show him a big deal. So he decides to strike the rock, which was not what God told him to do. And here's why this is so important is because both of these things attempted to make Moses the hero of the story and not God. And here's the hard part of this. And in the honest truth we learn from Moses is if you are the hero of your story, no one else is getting saved. You hear that? If you want to be the hero to fix everything, to make sure everything is great, then either your story is going to be really small and lame, or everyone's going to suffer with you. And Moses kind of almost takes this place that God is the one providing it, but Moses kind of wanted the eyes to be on him, and he let his frustration boil over, which you can understand and feel for Moses. If two million people are complaining to you, you have some reason to be frustrated, okay? Okay. But he let this boil over to the fact that he let all eyes go on him. And the point of this was that God would display his holiness, not Moses. And it would be crystal clear that God was delivering the people from their their situation, that he was the hero of the story. You see, when we start to define our reality through our power, through our lens, through our ability, here's what happens is we get a really depressing view of the future. Because I don't know about you, you can only work so hard You can only be so much emotionally stable. You can only raise your kids so well. You can only love your spouse so much. You can only help your community to such a degree that if it's all dependent on you, the future does not look very bright. And sadly, I think we have families and generations of families and individuals who try to bear the weight of the future on their shoulders instead of looking to something in someone who is bigger than themselves. What shifts our story is how do we do that? How do we stop defining reality on our terms by our power, instead define reality by God's power? You see, Moses here, he ends up failing bad. And this story here is it's, it's pretty depressing because he fails, but he also fails so roughly that he himself does not get to enter into the promised land. And he himself is prohibited from seeing God's future plan of what would happen. But here's, before he messes up, Moses actually gives us some amazing steps that we get to follow when we trust God's vision for the future. And the first is so simple but it's so hard to do in the moment of we define reality by God's power when we pray about it. Check out verse six. It says, then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting. They fell face down in the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Look at just the beauty in the imagery that gives us. His Moses and Aaron are standing in front of the people. They're hearing the complaints. They're literally hearing the people say in verse five that it'd be better if we just stayed in Egypt or we just died, that this situation is so horrible. And they went from standing in front of these people who had all these problems and all these obstacles to going to the feet of the Lord. They went in front of the assembly to in front of the tent in the meeting and they fell face down before God. Now, if we're honest, how much of us fall face down before God when we come against our problems? How often do we just trust him and say, hey, before I do anything else, I'm going to pray about this. And here's what I love is the person he takes with him is his brother, Aaron, his closest friend. And he says, hey, Aaron, this, this is a mess. Like, I don't know how we're going to do this. You know what we should go do? Let's go talk to God. Like, I don't see a way forward yet. I don't see the path we're going to take. But you know what? I bet if we pray about this, God's going to give us some clarity. 
And you see, all of us can fall into this trap of running away from God, but the model we see here is how can we go to God and say, man, this situation is so messed up, but God, can you help define it for me? And guess what? This also changes usually how we pray. Too often when we come into our prayers, we have like a list of things that we need God miraculously do for us. Like God fix my kids. God uh, help my financial situation, right? God make my boss less of a jerk. Um, Or if you are the boss, God make my employees want to work, okay? (laughs) God make someone, send me someone who wants to work so I can hire them. That's the prayer that I'm hearing most bosses pray right now. But these laundry list things, we like want God miraculously to change everything. But it's funny, when we read scripture, prayers aren't always like that. I think of David in the Psalms when he prays, God, create a clean heart within me and renew a steadfast spirit within my life. When David was praying, he said, God didn't fix all my problems. He says, God, fix me so I can see my problems how you see them. God, fix first the problems in my heart, rather the problems in my world, so that all of a sudden I can start to see the world that you see it. Jesus, what if we prayed this of shower us with your grace, Lord, so let your Holy Spirit be my eyes and show me the reality in front of me and not the reality that is shrouded by my ego and my sin. And you see, that's, that's a hard place to start, but it gets even harder. Because the second way we see this as we let God uh, define our reality by our power is we then let God equip us. Check out verse 7. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses. He says, take the staff and assemble the community. You and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock. Okay, we've already seen what he's going to do. God very clearly, this is why he's upset. He didn't say, strike it with a staff. He says, I've given you this staff. But he says, speak to the rock. He says, while they watch, and it will yield its water. You will bring out water from the rock and provide drink from the community and their livestock. So Moses took the staff in the Lord's presence, just as he had commanded him. Listen to what God tells him. Is God says, hey, I have this staff for you. I've given you an object, I've given you resources, and I've given you instructions on how to enact that plan. And wouldn't it be so awesome if God just did that for us in all of our daily lives? I've given you the resources, I've given you the roadmap, go do them. And many are like, man, Moses, like, he had it right there in front of him. Like, why didn't he just listen to God? Like, Moses, you're a smarter dude than that. Like, I don't even feel bad for you anymore because God gave you like two directions like a toddler and you didn't follow them. Do you know that God's given you instructions and resources for your life right in front of you? So often we pray prayers and it's like, God, show up. God, show me a way. God, do this. God, do that. God, do that. And he's like, have you read my word? All the resources we're ever going to need are right here. All the instructions for the way our feet should be going is here, reaching here, and the Holy Spirit guiding us on where we should go. And so often the problem isn't that God isn't speaking, it's that we're not listening and we're not ready for him to equip us. We think, no, I can do it on my own. I don't know about you, but I am a fixer. Meaning the reason I don't go to my wife and say, hey, let's talk about this, let's solve this, is because I want to fix the problem so I can go to her and be like, already done. Like, I don't need equipping. I don't need to do this. I don't need to go through these steps. I can just solve it on my own, and then I can be the hero of the story like we talked about before, and I can look awesome. You know what the problem is? It works about half the time. The other half, I make it a lot worse. And then we come to the table and I come to the feet of God or I come to the people around me and say, hey, I know I tried to fix this situation, but I think I made it worse than it was before when God's like, hey, I'm going to provide a way. And this is so difficult because God equips us with things that are usually much more humble and much more godly than brash and in our face. 
Usually we're like, God, I want you to quit me through this financial situation of give me the courage to call up that bill collector and yell at him until he negotiates a better price and everything will be great. But God's not usually going to equip you that way. Instead, he's going to equip you with love and humility to deal with people in a godly, Christ-like fashion that usually doesn't resolve issues the way our world resolves issues. But when we ask God to equip us, when we look to the resources, to the staff he has laid before us, God will start to work. And here, just a little observation about this story again that I just love so much. You're like, why was it such a big deal that Moses just hit the stone instead of speaking to the stone like God asked him because God wanted to make it very clear who was in charge of all this. God didn't want to say, show Israel that, hey, this is just like some special rock that if you hit it, there's like a river or a spring like hiding underneath it. He wanted Moses to stand back, put some distance in there and say, hey, rock, produce water and this walk naturally flow out because then there would be no other explanation than God did that. Which leads to this very last point we'll see in our story is the last way that we define reality by God's, uh, in God's way, by God's power, is we wait for God's holiness to move. Check out verse 13, the very last verse in kind of this section in this story right here. It says that these are the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and listen to this little subnote. And he demonstrated his holiness to them. You know, if you read this story by itself, kind of in isolation, it's really not that good of a story. It's kind of depressing. It's people complaining. It's them looking to God, it's God intervening, and then it's them not listening to what God intervened about, and then about Moses facing consequences, and then God saying, tough luck, guys, I'm so holy. In the end result of this story, and what you would be known in the canon of Scripture, is that Moses doesn't get to go to the promised land from this. One of the greatest leaders in all history, this was probably the lowest point of his life. But despite all of that, and despite kind of how depressing this story is in so many ways, this last little line just cannot be overlooked. That it says God demonstrated his holiness to them. You see, there was such an urgency in this story to change their situation, to change the obstacles in their life as quickly as possible. But God was more like, chill out. Because changing your situation as quickly as possible and getting from point A to point B right now is never God's plan. God's plan is in the midst of that journey to show you he is holy and he is in control. And God's goal here was that they would sit back through all this and they would witness his holiness and be like, there's no other explanation that we can come up with other than God is in charge. You see, we all have this human component stuck in all of our heads that whenever a situation comes up, we need to be done with it. We need to fix it. And I need to get from point A to point B as quick as possible. Often, I run into so many guys who are struggling, who are down on their luck, guys who are homeless, guys who are in bad situations. And here's the common denominator I get through all of it is, hey, if I had one night in that hotel, if I had this amount of money, everything in my life would be different. And I lovingly offer what we have, but I say, hey, this one thing's not gonna change your situation because there wasn't one bad issue that got you in that situation. It's usually a thousand micro little decisions that get us off course, that leads us to the point we're at. And spiritually, when we look at our lives and we look at God and be like, God, why is this so messed up? God, why do I feel this disconnect with you? Why is all these things in my life seem to be burning and be chaos? It's never one big mistake you made but it's the thousand little sins and compromises you made along the way that led you to that point. And here, God is showing his people 
That it's not that you just need some quick fix to get you out of your situation, but you need the long-term answer to see the world how I see it. Which brings us to our key truth today. And it is this, and this is a hard one to just let rest on us and attempt to apply, but here it is, is that we will never have an accurate view of reality if we don't include God in the process. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, and these, these verses are going to sound probably a little bit out of left field, but bear with me and I'll show you how we get here. It says this, Paul writes and he says, but the person without the spirit does not receive what comes from God's spirit because it's foolishness to him. He is not able to understand since he's evaluated spiritually. He says, a spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. Verse 16, for this is the kicker, and this is kind of what illuminates this verse here. He says, for who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You see, what Israel lacked is when they saw their situation, they said, I'm gonna do everything in my power to fix it. I'm gonna go to our leaders and I'm gonna complain. I'm gonna demand that change happen in our world on our time by our means. When the whole time God was like, I don't want you to have that view. I want you to see that no matter where you go from here, if you aren't dependent on me, you will be off track in what I have for your life. And when we fully surrender to God, when we say, I don't have all the answers, that I don't have the power to get where I need to go, we surrender our lives to him and we start to see things through God's eyes and our lives begin to be transformed. And here's the hard news in all this is it doesn't just happen overnight. It happens one step at a time. This begins with us falling on our face to God, of accepting Jesus as Savior, of saying, hey, you have died for my sins. You have risen again. You have forgiven me for the mistakes I made, and I want to live differently in you. And then from that decision, it evolves a little more. And then it says, you know what? I'm gonna go hang out with other people who have made that decision too. You know what we call that? Church. And then we say, you know what, I wanna take this a step further. I'm gonna start reading this whole book of instructions and resources that you've given me. Then we take a little step further and then I'm gonna pray about this constantly, that it be implanted in my heart that it start to change the way I think, the way I feel, the way I do things. And what happens is we begin to see our reality through the mind of Jesus Christ. We start to see our situation through the eyes of God. And what we ultimately determine is that it's not to build our kingdom, it's not to display our power and influence, but it's so that we and the world around us can witness the holiness of our God.